got about a minute or seven. So part of the new policies and procedures going forward for public meetings, board of works, council meetings, we are working to incorporate public comments into the meeting as part of the scheduled topic. This is something that the councils and I have talked about as a good way to provide more engagement and immediate feedback inside something. So how it will work is there are these cards, they're here on the table. Please uh, date, name, and your address along with which topic you would like to speak on. They would please do a, a card for each topic. So if you were here to speak about something that the chief of police were to talk about, fill out a card for that. If you're here to talk about the housing authority, fill out a card for that. Put them in the basket. Uh, Kristen, the communications director for the city, will organize them and give them to me as we sort of approach each of those topics. How it will work is the person listed on the agenda here to speak will come and do their speaking presentation. Questions, comments from the council will be directed at the speaker. And then we will have an opportunity for uh, the public comment card <coughs> submissions to speak for two minutes. Attorney Stephen will keep the time for that. And then once we've gone through those lists, the council will be able to redirect questions back to who was the presenter for said topic before voting. Is that clear as mud? Okay. We will, we will stumble through it a little bit, but if you do have an interest on a topic, please fill that out. Uh, please keep it related to what is on the agenda. And with that, let's do the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Today is Monday, February 3rd, 2020, the time being 7 p.m. The meeting of the Greensburg City Council is called to order. At this time, please silence all electronic devices. To comply with Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the city requests that participants in this meeting complete a voluntary anonymous survey that is available in the back um, at the table. On the table. Roll call, please, Brenda. By Adam McKenzie. Here. Kevin Sweetland. Here. Rick Amsweller. Here. Kevin Sweetland. Here. Carol Poling. Here. Jane King. Here. Okay. Um, approval of the minutes from January 6th, 2020. All of you should have received a copy of that in your packets. Make a motion to approve. Second. Okay. All of those in favor of approving the, amend the minutes, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those aye. opposed? Okay. Old business. Um, Chief Bridges. Second, final reading of the UTV side-by-side -side ordinance. Good evening. I uh, believe the ordinance uh, through last meeting has been updated. Is that correct? It has not. So actually, I will I will take the floor. I I apologize. I have not got an opportunity to update the uh, the UTV ordinance as we had previously discussed, or had an opportunity to speak with Chief Bridges to get that done. Uh, so I am uh, regrettably, unfortunately, asking council to table that for one more moment to allow me to finish those things. I'll make a motion to the table. Second. <coughs> All those in favor of tabling the ordinance for next month, say aye. 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 So part of that last meeting, um, we talked about a, a type of registration that we would look at to put on the UTVs to where we can easily identify so uh, Assistant Chief McNeely and I have worked on something today to where I will pass this around, everybody's okay with it, um, where we would have a license plate face, or on the rear of the UTVs and uh, it would have the uh, City of Greensburg across the top with the new uh, Greensburg logo off to the side and then we would have them numbered um, starting with 001 and go up and then that way we could track those registrations through um, our CAD system. So I will pass this along. What kind show. of cost are you talking about in terms of the plate? Uh, about $8. $8 to $9. So depending on what you want to go with, plastic, aluminum, and that. So that's what we're going to do. About the cost on that. Is it like a, a small plate, like a motorcycle plate, or a larger plate? So right now, the with the companies we've looked through, the standard plate is what we're finding. 
we're wanting to try to find something a little bit smaller due to it's a smaller <coughs> uh, vehicle on the roadway. So I guess that's a question I can ask the council is, would you like the regular, um, would you recommend the regular size plate or a smaller plate? Um, it's going to be, what's going to be easier for you guys to see? Yeah. Tell you the truth, probably a normal. The bigger yeah. plate. Because we were looking at the sticker at one point, but we figured that the plate would probably be better just because of the sticker on where it would actually be placed. Um, you can uh, buy the uh, mounting brackets for a plate um, online for specialized for UTVs. Um, so that's another thing that we're kind of looking at. Absolutely. Pure safety. I'll pass this one around and I'll get it out of the meeting in the next. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Whatever Thank you. you. Appreciate it, sir. Um, up <laughs> next, we have the second final reading of Ordinance 2020-1, which was the staffing ordinance that all of you reviewed last opportunity to return to the City Council meeting. Uh, Greensburg Housing Authority, as you know, has been in default to HUD in the amount of $27,279 to repay over a period of three years. In the initial visit here to City Council, we were strapped to ask for the entire amount of funds without having an option to seek funding from other sources or properly address any questions or concerns. Since the initial meeting, HUD granted Greensburg Housing Authority a second extension to February 7, 2020. In the recent few weeks, Susan Beard and myself have been advocating on behalf of the Greensburg Housing Authority to raise funds to keep the business local and retain the personal relationships with our landlords and clients. Below you will see a chart of donations and the amounts that we have acquired in the duration and total of those amounts. We just kind of put a little chart. We didn't put who they were from because someone will remain anonymous. <coughs> uh, Susan Beard and I have raised $14,333 in letters of intents, checks, and cash from various sources. Currently, we are waiting on responses from the Decatur County Community Foundation, Community Church of Greensburg, a landlord, and other sources who would like to remain anonymous. It is our hope city council members would consider granting us funds for over a period of three years to aid in our endeavor. Funds ranging from anywhere from $1 to $12,949. Any amount council members may feel comfortable in aiding this journey would be a blessing in disguise, if anyone so chooses. The monies then would be returned to the Greensburg Housing Authority to our HUD Held Reserve account to be used as it was originally intended. We are currently eligible to help families in this community starting in February. We are working on adding up to four new program family members in March and four new program members in April. The program is flowing very well and maintaining <clears throat> nicely. If Greensburg Council members choose not to help, we want to sincerely thank you for allowing us back here um, to revisit this topic. We will keep actively searching for help in the community till the deadline, which is February 7th, because um, we want to see this journey through to its conclusion. Our program representative mentioned today to us that our program is actually going to go to the Indianapolis State of Indiana Housing Agency if um, the board members vote to voluntarily transfer the program. Currently, the vote is not to transfer the program. In fact, we received an email today from the director of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development stating the opposite for Greensburg Housing Authority. Uh, we did attach that email, and we just want to thank you so much for your time and consideration to actually have us back. So thank you. And then the email, I, I don't you know if I really need to read that. I just attached it for you guys to let you know that they're wanting to kind of help keep us here. So thank you. that was my presentation. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, council, questions, comments? That's awesome, by the way. What you really have done, that is fantastic. Thank you. Uh, that is, uh, you, you both should be very proud of that. <coughs> Appreciate that. <coughs> so 
just for full transparency, so I want to make sure everybody on the council is aware, um, I did receive a call from uh, Donna Taylor with Human Services last Friday, um, and she mentioned that she got an email from Indiana IHCDA on uh, those vouchers, so if they were to close <coughs> the Greensburg Housing Authority, those vouchers would go back to the IHCDA. That's not true. <laughs> they just left. <laughs> Yeah. So I'm um, just saying, I'm just yeah. expressing what you told me. That way, everybody, I want everybody to at least have the, I don't want to share some information oh, and, and they don't have it at least. So, Absolutely. Um, so IHCDA said that they would supposedly have it, had an email um, that would transfer those back to Human Services. Human Services covers five counties, Johnson, Jackson, Shelby, Bartholomew, and Decatur. Um, and then in those counties that they don't have a local housing authority, they also cover the cities. So example, Shelby County, they cover the city of Shelbyville as well. Um, so they, they do that, they would it, they would basically remain, take those vouchers, uh, and like I think we've mentioned clearly before, uh, none of the people on the services would lose their vouchers uh, at all. Uh, and then it would just be a matter of if vouchers, as vouchers were renewed or expired and the new people came on the program, those vouchers would actually go back to IHCDA to determine who got the vouchers or where those vouchers got. Were given to, um, and that so they may or may not decide. Yeah. Yeah, they may or may not decide to bring them back to uh, Greensburg or Decatur County. They may give them somewhere else. Uh, However, um, it has not been determined that we were going to transfer, so there has not been a decision made by the HUD field office. That's why they've left, um, and it's not guaranteed it would go there. That is our hope. If we don't make the funding, that it will go there. Um, because I just recently transferred somebody out through IHCDA and they were not able to absorb them. I'm actually being billed for them to have that person because they don't have the ability to absorb right now. So our vouchers are still in jeopardy and that's why we were just speaking with them in the hall and they decided to leave because they didn't know if they could bring anything. We invited them to stay, but... Um, but I, I spoke to Donald's Jennifer... Here. What's Jennifer's last name? Um, Oh, Jennifer, my head wrap? Yes. Uh, I don't know her last name. Charles. Jennifer Charles, yes. From uh, the HUD office in Indianapolis, I spoke with her today as well. Um, and she indicated that um, the, the vouchers would have to be voluntarily, you basically you have to voluntarily um, remove those. I, I don't know what happens if they decide to shut you down, how that happens with vouchers, or if they're just lost at that point in time. No, we'll let them go. Okay. We're not going to lose them. She, she, didn't, she didn't mention that, um, but basically uh, the one thing that I was concerned about after I spoke with Jennifer and being transparent is and I asked her probably three or four different times during the conversation, so if, um, you know, if we do agree to give the money, um, I, I was looking for some kind of guarantee or promise that they wouldn't go ahead and turn around and shut down the housing authority. Um, in fact, basically during the conversation, she made a comment to me that they were shutting down several smaller housing authorities throughout the state. That were insolvent, yes. Right. They and are. so uh, she, she never gave me a very confident answer that um, the only answer she gave, well, if they're doing what they're supposed to do, then we probably wouldn't shut them down. Um, so just being clear that she, she did not reassure me that even if we give the money, that they wouldn't shut the housing authority down anyway. And, Absolutely. And she was, uh, she, you know, just trying to be transparent that way. Well, that's fine. Everybody well, on this council has all the information. Yeah, well, 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 folks, but Thank you. all keep talking at the same time. So when the, when the recorder gets comes back, if you guys keep talking over him and he keeps talking over you, it just becomes a big mess. So, Jamie's done, Miss Ashley or Miss Beard, whichever one of you wants to talk, talk, but identify who you are. I am Susan Beard. Uh, the If you read the email that I received from Jennifer Charles, she said, by the February 7th deadline, we will refund. We will not pay the money. We will give it back. We're not paying anything in and we're not going to pay most of it. That's why we're going to for the commitment of the three years. With letters of intent. So with letters of intent. And that here that they will I thought it was my understanding if we made the letters of intent, that money was we had to pay that money regardless. And then that was, that's what we were told. I posited that's what we were told. That's what we were told because it was, uh, um, that was, that was one of the concerns because it's, it's kind of two different pots of money. 
and then the 28,000, and then you're also in arrears of what, the 24,000? 19. Okay. Um, this is Melissa. Um, if they get the, re the amount of money that we are advocating for, then we are going to stay open. They don't come after the arrears. That's just money we have to get back to balance to zero within the next three years. That's not money they come after. Um, to answer your question, though, if we make the amount of money and you commit to it, then we're staying open, then yes, you are committed to that. If we don't make the amount of money, then that decision gets made with them, like whether we're going to close or not. So you're not out money either way. I mean, you know, they're not coming. The administrative money that you're talking about, they can't come after. They have nothing to do with that. Um, she spoke with Mr. Marsh on the phone with him about it, Vaughn Stevens. Yeah, but I think Councilman Kane's question is that if they give you the money, you get all $28,000, mm -hmm. they can still come and close you tomorrow. Like, if you give them the money. No. So let's say we, we provide the money, and then six months from now they decide we're going to close that housing authority. They still have every right to do that, and that they can do that. And that's pretty much what Jennifer alluded to on the call. That there's nothing that says they can't shut the housing authority down. They just may choose not to. Right? That's not our understanding. I think her comment to me was something I, I'm trying to. It was basically as long as you're doing everything you're supposed to do, you know, they probably wouldn't shut that housing authority down. Probably didn't give me a very good sound, you know. And this is after I, I questioned her on it three different times during the phone call. So it's. Um, and she kept giving me a different answer, and then finally that was the answer she gave me at the end. I just, I wasn't reassured that um, the housing authority, that they wouldn't eventually come back and shut it down anyway. So that was my concern after spoken to Jim. That was mine. And I may be interpreting that or filtering that. Okay. I'm not really understanding that. Also, I, I, once we fulfill the debt, we are back to running them we weren't in fear of being shut down at that point. Right. No, no, it, absolutely. I agree with that comment. Okay. But they're shutting housing authorities down around the state, and yes. several of them. And so they may, at some Due point, to that time, they may decide that they're going to shut it down anyway. Whether it's solvent or not, they may decide they want to shut it down. Oh, down. that has not been expressed to me, so I don't have an answer. Sorry. And, uh, during this conversation, I don't know, 27 to No, sir. What's your time frame for repaying the <clears throat> They want us to get that to a zero balance. They would like it to be this year or next, but just to work towards it. And since November, we have decreased it from 20800 to January to 19280 That's not money that they owe them. Yeah, that's, that's their right. operating expenses for yeah. their office. That's not money that is owed. And we receive money it's monthly to operate. They're, they're in a to ourselves. <coughs> it's not money that they will come after. But thanks again for considering. Did I answer your question properly? Yeah. And then let's go back to the 27 too. Yes. If you do not receive That is correct. They will be set. Yes, they will. Absolutely. Thank you again. Forgetting this email, forgetting that house, human services. Yes. What what you do for the city, they do for the county. Yes, sir. Yes. 
we have a memorandum of understanding between us right now uh, because we serve in town and they serve out in the county. Yeah, so we don't mix. But she can still put people in town if there's a need. So if your office is, if you do not receive the 2017 funding, they would, through normal course of operation, take that money? We don't know. We're hoping that that's the direction it would go, but that has not been guaranteed to us. And whose decision is that? The Indianapolis Field Office. Because IHCDA is a different entity. They're uh, outsourced. That's probably the best word to use. Nicole's program is, they're like a contracted employee. Other questions or comments? We have one person from the audience here that will speak on the topic. Thank you guys so much. You guys did awesome, by the way. Oh, thank you. Mr. McGinn from Terra Road, here to speak on the Housing Authority, sir. Well, Thank you, Mayor and the Council for giving me the opportunity to talk. A couple weeks ago, I read in the paper where you voted three to two not to fund the Housing Authority uh, like the county did. That really disappointed me. I have a major concern. There's a lot of special needs people that's on this program. I was in a meeting last week on the 22nd, I guess it was, and we talked about this. Several people with special needs is really calling on the housing authority for their needs. And the discussion went kind of like this. If the housing authority leaves this community and would go to Marion County, our people the special needs would never have an opportunity for a new person to ever get on this program. And it was also discussed that it was also discussed that there's some people that if they lost this, they would be on the streets because they have no family support system. My thinking is just I don't know what the city budget is. <coughs> it might be millions, I don't know. But if you would support this, $4,000 a year for the next three years is kind of a, a drop in the bucket to what your budget is. Truthfully, I would be disappointed if you vote against it. I'm just one person. I have a special needs son. I would, it would really impact that community. Okay? So, I want you to think really serious about how you vote. I know there's 63 people in this city that's on this program. Every one of them 63 needs it. We're fortunate right here in this room. We don't have to have assistance. We got great jobs, great incomes, insurance. But these 63 people, they need this. So give a lot of thought to this. Please. Time is up, sir. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Other comments or questions? I was really hoping to hear from Donna. So. <coughs> I, I know that I spoke, when I spoke with Jennifer Charles uh, from HUD, that she knew that the representative was coming and she was, she was trying to make phone calls to prevent that from occurring. I don't know why that is. Uh, but I, I know that Donna told me on the phone on Friday uh, that she had a letter from IHCDA that basically stated that if uh, they received those vouchers, that they would reallocate those vouchers to human services. So if that's the case, then those those vouchers would still be remain at a local office in our community. So I, 
I just want to make sure that I'm processing this all. Um, did I hear that the, the, exist, the, the counties around us, they have their own housing office, human resource office. Is that a correct statement? So human services covers human five counties. So Johnson, Jackson, Bartholomew, Decatur, and Shelby. Okay. And so an example like Shelby County where they don't have a city housing authority, uh, they service the, the city and the county. Bartholomew County or the Decatur County where we have a city wide housing authority, they cover the county, they don't cover the city. And then the other thing was um, the money that the city would put in would be to pay back money that was taken away. Uh, I'll just say how, how it was. It was uh, investment 20 years ago. So now that money is going back to pay this off. Now, if they're going in and they're shutting down some of these smaller offices, that money we will not get back. <coughs> That's totally different than, than that operation. So it does concern me that we put out, whether it be 14000 or whatever it is, that money, once we spend it, it's gone. I know, just to be clear and make sure that I think, this, if I misrepresent this, you can tell me, but. Um, they, they've assured that if not, that $27,200, whatever gets paid, it would come back into the Greensburg Housing Authority funds. Yes, now, service. that doesn't say that they may not take other funding that they would they would have used to give and take some of that away to compensate, but it, but that $27,200 is, is going to come back. It doesn't, yeah, but it doesn't say that they may not reallocate other funds. That's what yes, gonna... yes, please. It has to be paid back to them on paper, but it has to be allocated back to Greensburg Housing Authority on paper because it was their money to begin with, and it has to be used in this county the way it was <coughs> intended to be used in the first place. And it's the way we were told by Von Stevens, the debt collector, once we satisfy this obligation to HUD, we are not in jeopardy of being shut down. The other housing authorities that you were discussing today that are in jeopardy of being shut down is due to the same type of issue, but they're their issues, and they are not repaying or seeking out help to get repayments. That's why they're being shut down. I just want to clarify that. Uh, I guess yes. I, I apologize. Overstepping. I'm just trying to make sure I understand what you're saying. You're not in jeopardy of being shut down any more so than you are any other Right? Like you are a federally funded entity. Yes. Sir. Like so, if the federal government tomorrow said we're not funding HUD ever to anybody, they can shut you down, right? Absolutely. Right. I would right. say so. So, but this is not. But so when they're talking, when when Councilman McCain is talking about you have exposure of being shut down, such as these insolvent ones may also that exists whether regardless, right? That exists whether you have money, don't have money. That's just the normal risk of any business that's federally funded, correct? Mm -hmm. If I'm understanding your question, yeah. Because <laughs> okay. with the, the funding, that's what's causing us to be in this particular situation. If we didn't have that, then we would be fine if we were running correctly. If we re-ran like they did in the past, then of course, same situation. But thank you. <laughs> I'll make a motion so you go ahead and pay for Stephen $12,000. Okay. There's been a motion made by Councilman Ms. Weller to pay the $12,000 over the next three years. Specifically $12,000 or $12,949? Whatever the they need. to pay an amount for three years, not 
not to exceed not not twelve thousand nine hundred forty nine. That would they go get other funding? It, it could reduce it, but right. not so not to exceed. Not to exceed. For several reasons, I'm just so conflicted and it's, it's upsetting. Um, but the simple fact that I, I truly believe, based on the information I have, that nobody on the service is going to lose their service, um, and that these vouchers are going to be transferred back to another local office in our community that's already in our city, um, pending things that go the way they do if they don't get that money. Um, and then also, based on the lack of assurances that I've got from Jennifer Charles from that office today. I will make a motion that we don't fund the housing authority. Council McCain has made a motion to not fund the housing authority. Is there a second? Next on the agenda, we have some new business to come before the council. EDC Director Brian Robbins is here with Drive Alliance, a waiver of a non-compliance for a tax abatement purpose. Mr. Robbins is um, Mr. Linden Lamb. Linden Law Officer. Okay. Sorry about that. So is with, he with you? Yes, he's with the time. Okay, yeah, he's with Drive Alliance. Um, everybody get a copy of the resolution. It's a, essentially a waiver of non-compliance. The tax abatement committee. Uh, met a few weeks ago uh, under the request of Thrive Alliance. The situation is thus, <coughs> back in 2002, as a match uh, for an application for a, a grant with the ICDA uh, to renovate the old Decatur Apartments building downtown as well as the old YMCA and the building on North Street uh, just to the, uh, the north of the YMCA. Um, uh, project to develop all three structures. Um, Drive Alliance applied and as a match from the city, uh, the city uh, gave that project um, a 10-year abatement. Um, the project was completed uh, in uh, 2005 and reassessed in 2000, uh, 2015 and reassessed in 2016. Uh, so the abatement would have started in 2016, paid 2017 taxes. Uh, unfortunately, Thrive Alliance failed to submit the CF1s at the time, not only for 2016-17, uh, uh, but also 17 paid 18 and 18 paid 19. Uh, and we met with them later, uh, a lot 
late last year, and they, must have, they might still be able to acquire those. Uh, the, the maintenance and make up for um, the past credits. Uh, I spoke to um, the state, and they said that is plausible. We can do that. Um, I also spoke to, and they, they sat on a way to do that. And essentially, they would the abatement savings would be calculated and credited <coughs> towards future taxes, tax liability. Uh, but we need to pass a waiver of non-compliance and accept those past CF1 forms that have been submitted. Um, I got with uh, um, Attorney Stephen, uh, and he, he drafted up this waiver of non-compliance, um, and also met with the uh, tax abatement uh, committee, and they thought that, and I want to make this clear, that only because this was this served as a city match for a grant application that we would honor this. Normally, if, if this happens in, a, in the occurrence of a regular abatement, this would not be the process that we would go through. But in the same way, if the city uh, puts up funding uh, for matches for, you know, for a project or an application, uh, we should also honor our, our match to that. So the, uh, the resolution you have before you is a waiver of non-compliance uh, stating that uh, not only there's a just two, two typos in this. I'm sorry. Again. But, uh, um, and the third, whereas, in the, uh, uh, and it says, uh, grant was received in 2013, the construction completed in 2000, it should be 2015, the 250. And then there's a uh, uh, final close parentheses next to the impacted years back in the last whereas on the page. But, um, so, um, with that, we ask for the by city council to accept this waiver of non-compliance. It also explicitly states in the resolution that um, this is not carried towards any uh, lack of liability for any future submittals, meaning that they are required as any tax abatement would be, or recipient would be to file the, uh, move forward all the CF1s on time or face possible uh, deletion of that savings for that year. This also stem for this was the one that didn't have a date on it. Yes, we, we were somewhat the city was somewhat at fault as, as well. We did not specify any sort of limitations as to when the abatement could be started. Uh, and as as Councilwoman Mackenzie said, we, we did not have a date uh, and was assured that from moving. And this is back in 2012 uh, before I think really many people were sitting on the table, but. Uh, uh, that will not be continued. We will always have a date uh, moving forward, so this doesn't uh, happen uh, or be at fault on the city's side. Any further questions for Mr. Rock? And again, I do want to really harp on the point that this is a, is a unique situation because it is a city match. This is not going to be the standard. T typically, our process is the CF1 renewals, and so if they're not going to fill out the renewals, then it's not, we're not out there seeking them to file the renewals, right? It's their responsibility. So, this was a different case, and this is why the tax abatement committee recommended this. Any other questions? Sir, do you have anything you'd like to add? I just wanted to let you please know. Come up, please come up, state your name so that we can get it on the report. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. I'm Mark London, Model Executive Director of Thrive Alliance. I um, just wanted to let you know that I was here and I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, that you might have on this. Um, clearly, there was a, a timing error on our part in getting the paperwork in, so we appreciate your consideration on the resolution in front of you. Thank you. on the recommendation of the uh, abatement uh, committee to allow the waiver of uh, non-compliance resolution 2020-4.
Others in favor of passing the waiver of non-compliance for the tax payment for private lines, 2020-4, say aye. All those opposed? Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Up next, we have Chief uh, Bridges with a request for additional appropriations for public safety. Good evening. Do we have an ordinance number on this? We have what? An ordinance number on this additional appropriation. Of I did not have one. Okay. So we may need to table this. Um, one second. Let me give you a number. Okay. Please. Thank you. I think that um, <laughs> I, I believe that the number would be fine. So um, I am asking for an additional appropriation for a payout of retired officer David Wilson. This payout would include uh, the uh, vacation hours, sick hours, and comp time payout. And the total amount that I am requesting out of the public safety is $19,000. Is that his entire payout or just uh, That's the entire. This is also something you asked for last year as part of the budget process. That is correct. And then it was recommended that we go through the one time of the public safety due to a reoccurring with several officers or and or firefighters retiring. This would be one way that we can uh, not have to put so much in our normal budget and just take out public safety. So. <laughs> My name is Brenda Dwinger. Um, having come uh, to the city from uh, the Decatur County Treasurer's Office, I would like to enlighten you on some of my expertise of investing money. The um, Decatur County um, received over two hundred and fifty eight thousand dollars in the year two thousand and nineteen. That was our final number for uh, additional income to the county due to investing and uh, the interest earned on money that was invested by the treasurer's office. Uh, there have been previous resolutions and also some minutes that concerned me uh, as I came into office. Um, one of the things that um, I noted was that Baker Tilly had helped the treasurer, and it is my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong and you are on the council and, and think that it's different. I was under the understanding that Baker Tilly would charge $1,000 per million dollars invested, such as when uh, they invested $4,700,000 uh, in October for a three month period. Baker Tilly received $4,000 in compensation for investing that money for a three month period. So I would like to be able to move forward. I do not plan to use any investment firms. I plan to use the knowledge that I've gained in the last four years and, and my own educational uh, knowledge that I have and be able to invest city funds as I see fit. That Therefore, if I was allowed to do that, the resolution number 219-7 um, uh, on the last page, and I'm sorry, I don't think you have a copy of that, but I'll gladly show it to you. There was uh, item number two uh, called um, 
reporting, the investment officer shall request approval of amounts invested at city council meetings. I would like to uh, propose that I could submit a resolution to you with that wording removed. And then I would report to you at each council meeting the investments that I had done and give you an opportunity through the year if you do not agree with my wording then we would go back that I would have to report to you or request approval before investing but as the financial officer for the city of Greensburg I do not believe that you can find uh, an Indiana code that would state that I would have to have that any questions just for clarification, I think we discussed it, but I, I just want to make a clarification. I think some of the funds that you're looking to invest in are a lot more like, liquid, so if there were an issue or if we needed to get the money back, most of those would be a pretty quick turnaround to get the money back. The four thousand, the four million seven hundred dollars would be going into a liquid account that uh, the city would would receive all of the interest from that. Uh, it would not be a three six, 12, nine, nine or 12 months CD, it would be liquid money. I have resources to find that and have already searched out uh, one of the resources that I used for the county and I've had numerous calls from other entities that I've invested, that I had invested with, with the county. There was already an ordinance that you had given permission um, to seek investors from outside what we the terminology that I know is bricks and mortar which means I could go outside of Decatur County to invest and I think that's probably been done because many of the banks here in within our county their home offices are in Cincinnati or not within our county I don't know of any bank at this point in time that their home office is within our county since the closing of main source So, Brenda, just out of, because I'm confused as exactly what you're asking for, are you asking the council to provide you with permission to draft the resolution and move forward on, on you being the investment person as opposed to utilizing a different company as previously uh, envisioned in prior resolutions? Right. In any, termination, in any terminology with the codes of uh, the state of Indiana or the state board of account, the city clerk treasurer is the investing officer and that had not been done in the past until October and so uh, I think at that time the council was concerned about how, the length of time that investments would be tied up and uh, the latter programs and that type thing and I I truly come before you believing that I have the knowledge to earn interest for the city's money and and the knowledge to make that profitable for the city and my only thing in going back through all of these because i had set in on several council meetings in 2019 and i knew that there was an area where the council had um, requested that they be they give an approval and um it, with the i i would just like to have that wording or terminology removed from that particular um, resolution so that I can move forward with investing for the city. So we can look forward to that from you next? Yes. If, if they are acceptable to receiving that and if possible to have a verbal agreement that I would be coming f before you next month with that resolution but giving me permission at that this time that I can move forward with investing now okay so that's a little that's different that's a little different so you're yes. asking for it says so in this resolution for an amendment to resolution 2019-7 to remove the language specifying uh, a separate investor to allow you to begin investing as the chief financial officer of the entity of the unit 
right. as the clerk treasurer. So right. just so that so the council is aware, the, uh, legally what we're what we're talking about is two essentially two different things. One would be a vote of confidence that yes, we think if you drafted a resolution that that said you were going to do all the investment, that we'd let you do it. Or not we, I call it you. I'll let, let that happen. And then a separate motion to amend 2019-7 uh, to strike the paragraph requiring a separate investor to do that, which would then essentially give her as the clerk treasurer the ability to proceed forward. Correct. Yeah, I think too, did you also state that, I know that in the, the prior one we had <coughs> said that they had to come to us with the amounts that they were going to invest, and Brenda's asking that she not have to do that. Right. And I think that's the correct. correct, and I will, and I apologize, I have not reviewed 2019-7, so I can't, I can't answer to you exactly what you're striking or which language that is. But that would be my yeah. That would be my understanding is that yeah, the, the requirement to ask for. So. Right here on number two. Okay, so the yeah, so the twenty the twenty nineteen seven uh, subsection 